Good evening, and I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. I am Mary Wood. I, um, I'm Mary Wood from the Wisconsin Parkinson Association, and our mission is to provide hope, support, community, and resources for people with Parkinson's and their loved ones. We have some great information to share with you tonight and would like to thank the Milwaukee Recreation Department for their partnership and support for this program. And also like to thank Daisy for being here with your uh, continued support as well and partnership. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Daisy Reimer from the Neuroscience Group to pre present some great information about Parkinson's disease. Hi there. My name is Daisy Reimer and I'm a nurse practitioner I specialize in Parkinson's disease and I work at the neuroscience group in Nina. I'm actually coming to you today from uh, my Berlin clinic. So, and we're gonna talk today about Parkinson's disease. We're gonna go over uh, some of the basics and beyond. Let's see. So discussion points. Uh, our primary goals tonight to uh, cover is what are the primary and the secondary symptoms of Parkinson's disease? Um, how, how do we diagnose Parkinson's disease? Uh, methods for treating motor, mood, and memory in Parkinson's disease. And I wanna give you some pearls really for living well with, with Parkinson's disease as well. So a little bit of discussion, and most of you may or may not know this, uh, Parkinson's is a loss of a neurotransmitter called dopamine in the brain. And uh, you have to lose about 70% of that dopamine before you have initial symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And the slide that you see here is um, a neuropathology of the area of the brain called the substantia nigra and nigra means black. And so you can see that right in here, um, along this edge of this slide of this tissue, it's a blackened area, and that's a normal um, substantia nigra because it, it's um, dopamine is black, okay? So when you lose dopamine in the brain, that area of the brain blanches. So you can see that um, there, the one on the left, is the Parkinson's substantia nigra, and that one's lighter. It doesn't have that kind of black streak through it. And that's typical of, of that loss of dopamine that we see in the brain. And that loss of dopamine um, has its effects on the body, of course. So what are the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? We always say that there are primary uh, features or what we call the cardinal features of Parkinson's disease. And those are tremor, uh, rigidity or stiffness, slowness or of movement, and impaired balance. Now, you don't have to have all of those uh, in order to have Parkinson's disease. Uh, tremor is really a, actually about 50% of people with Parkinson's disease. So you may go and you know, meet other people with Parkinson's and go, well, why don't they look like I do? And why don't uh, uh, I, my body, why doesn't my body behave like that? And you really can't compare yourself because these features really do vary in individuals, um, which makes it even more challenging, of course, uh, to treat. Secondary features of Parkinson's disease um, include small handwriting. So you may notice that, you know, over the years, uh, your handwriting may change due to tremor if you have tremor, uh, but it also can get smaller or kind of trail off a little bit more in the end. Um, you may or may not be swinging your arms fully. Usually the more affected side has a more reduced arm swing or may not swing at all. Um, and you may just find that you either drag a foot or there's more of a foot scuff on that affected side as well. And maybe it's both feet. Uh, people can have what's called freezing gait. And um, that doesn't mean you're cold in Wisconsin. I always tell people that means that there's some hesitancy. So you start walking and what always felt really natural and normal now feels a little disfluent. It feels like there's some hesitancy there. And it can be extreme enough to where people's feet actually feel like they kind of get stuck in place. 
my patients tell me they feel like their legs feel like tree stumps or they uh, like they have magnets on their shoes. Um, you can also have drooling. Uh, you can have less facial expression or what we call masked faces, um, softer voice, constipation, stooped posture, uh, anxiety and depression, as well as memory changes. And we'll go into that stuff just a little bit more detail in a little bit. So a person with Parkinson's could have trouble if given all those symptoms. They could have trouble getting out of bed, um, getting out of a chair, on and off the toilet. Um, obviously, problems with movement and walking, balance. And uh, a lot of my patients tend to fall backwards, um, which is why they tend to lean forward a little bit more is uh, to try to compensate for that, that feeling of falling backwards. Um, they may, some people have problems with swallowing. You may or may not. It's actually not that common to have problems with swallowing. Um, you could have low blood pressure um, or dizziness when you go from sitting to standing. Some people have double vision and some people have some changes with their uh, verbal fluency. So you know what you wanna say, but can't get it into words uh, or more, uh, in-depth uh, memory problems than that. I think it's important to know these secondary features because um, you know, we oftentimes think of Parkinson's and, and we just think about the walking changes or maybe the slowness, and we don't realize all of these other things can be part of the picture and it may be something that you need to talk to your provider about. Um, and that really should be what your appointments are about is saying, hey, I'm experiencing this and it's different. And uh, is this related to Parkinson's or is it related to something else? So I guess the question is, and I, I don't think you can see me, I was gonna go over a little bit of um, how we can do an exam to be able to assess somebody who has Parkinson's disease. And so you might think, well, how do they know? How do they know if I have Parkinson's? Well, there's a standardized exam that we perform and it's called a UPDRS, a Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. Okay, so there is a method to our madness when we're doing an exam in our office. And what we're doing is, um, for me, it's, it's a very regimen thing that I'm doing because uh, I always wanna, repeat the exam the same way with every single visit. Um, we are looking at tremor. So we'll make you hold your hands out and hold your hands in various positions. Um, and we're looking at the speed of the tremor. We're looking at um, how the tremor exists in certain positions. So is the tremor there when your hands are at rest? Um, are your when your hands are out extended in front of you is their tremor. And then we usually make you touch your nose, then touch our finger and go back and forth uh, to kind of take a look at, well, how hard is it for you to eat, right? Is there a tremor there when you're trying to reach for something or bring it to your mouth? So that's the reason why we do that piece of that exam. And we rate that on a zero to four scale, scale based on the severity. And we're documenting that with each visit we wanna do it initially, and then we also, to get a baseline, and then we also wanna do it on every single subsequent visit um, so that we can assess medication changes, uh, progression, and any side effects that you might be um, noticing. So uh, we also test uh, slowness, and how we do that is we make you uh, tap your fingers as fast as you can. And what we want you to do is hold them out in front of you and just tap your fingers as fast as you can. It's um, very sequential. We do that with the right hand, the left hand, um, open and close the hand. For me, I make people uh, put their hand on their lap and flip it back and forth as fast as they can. And then for the legs, we make you like stomp your foot up and down or tap your toes I think I'm getting video now. There I am. All right. So, so we're having you stomp, uh, stomp your feet 
uh, and tap your toes as well to assess that stiffness, uh, sorry, the slowness. Uh, for stiffness, what I'm doing is I actually take my patient's arm and uh, moving it around. And what I'm feeling for is any type of rigidity or uh, kind of feedback in those muscles. And I always say to my patients that the stiffness isn't in the joint. You know, we're not assessing arthritis. In fact, we're trying to really kind of rule that out. So it's not joint stiffness that we're assessing, it's muscle stiffness. Um, and sometimes what we feel is what we call cogwheeling, which is kind of this ratchety, it's kind of a ratchety movement that we feel when we're moving the arm and it doesn't feel natural and relaxed. So during that part of my exam, I'm asking a lot of questions. How's your sleep and things? Because it's kind of weird to have somebody moving your arm and leg around. Uh, so uh, we're assessing for rigidity and we are rating that again on a zero to four scale. And again, assessing any changes that we make in your treatment regimen. Uh, we're gonna assess your balance and your walking, make you stand up from the chair, preferably without using your arms. Um, we're gonna have you walk in the hallway. Uh, at my clinic, we do what's called a timed walk. Um, so we're trying to see how fast you can kind of get up and, and, and walk to a certain flag on the wall. Um, and then when you're walking, I'm looking at your posture. I'm looking to see if you tend to kind of lean forward and are more stooped with your posture. I'm looking at arm swing to see if both of them are swinging equally. And I'm looking at your feet to see if they scuff at all or if they move fluently. When you come back in the room, we tend to give you a little push from side to side and pull you backward to check your balance. So those are the basics, the real basics. It's kind of a summary a little bit of that UPDRS. And there are other pieces to that, uh, to that examination. There are subjective surveys for the patient to um, give us feedback on, but that's the actual exam that we do in the clinic. I'm gonna have you adjust my slide for me if you can. There we go. Super, so this, this list that's on here is a list that is put out by the Wisconsin Parkinson Association. And I just kind of wanted to put it on here because um, this is a list of medicines that you need to avoid uh, if you have Parkinson's disease. They can kick off the process of Parkinson's disease and they can worsen Parkinson's disease. So um, I put this in here because sometimes when we're assessing, does this person have Parkinson's? Um, we have to look at your medication profile and say, but is there a, a reason for it? Is there a medication that could be inducing this or making those symptoms worse? So um, I always make sure that people kind of are aware that uh, this card exists and hopefully you know about it. And I give it to every single new patient and it's something that's very important to have in your possession. So how do we decide how we treat Parkinson's? Well, I, I have to tell you that to me, treating Parkinson's is an art. <laughs> it's not always easy. And if you all talk to one another or you know of other people who have Parkinson's, you will know that there's, it's not cookie cutter. Uh, it's something that's very much honed to the person. However, there is a certain treatment algorithm that we use. Um, and a lot of times that's based on some um, pretty big decisions that we need to kind of know. So you can see here this, this little kind of diagram on the algorithm. Most of it has to do with whether or not a person is having problems with their cognition. Um, there are definitely certain medications that we want to avoid if a person is having problems with cognition, because even though they treat Parkinson's disease, they could worsen thinking. Um, and so that can limit our treatment in many different ways. Uh, sometimes that doesn't appear right away, though. So 
we may have to make alterations as we go along in treating Parkinson's disease if a memory problem is brewing. Um, so I'm not gonna go into great detail on that slide because I've got, uh, it's a little bit redundant. There's another slide that I'm gonna go into a little bit more. So I'm not gonna um, beat up all the medications here for you, but I just wanted to kind of cover, well, A, that there are a lot of medications for treating Parkinson's disease, not just one medication. Um, and the key is obviously, I always say to people is it's like Cinderella, if the shoe fits, um, then, it, then it's appropriate, but not everybody's uh, symptoms respond to the exact same medication. Uh, in my clinic, part of where I start with that is obviously assessing cognition. Um, the other piece is how you present with your symptoms. So some people come in and their main problem is tremor, right? Uh, they don't have a lot of balance problems or stiffness or slowness. It's mainly tremor that they're dealing with or that's their priority in treatment. So I have to take that into consideration and pick medications that are tremor specific. Uh, other people might not have a tremor at all and it's more stiffness uh, or balance problems and I might need to hone the medication to that. The other consideration is looking at your health history, your other medications uh, and making sure that a, the medications all play well in the sandbox together, uh, as well as making sure that we are treating symptoms and not making other problems worse. So for example, if you have problems with leg swelling, uh, if you use certain medications in our regimen for Parkinson's disease, you can make that worse because some of them, the side effect can be swelling. So you'll see that there are a lot of different medications and um, you might not ever try most of them, uh, but you should kind of know about them. That's kind of why I put this slide on here. So carbidopa levodopa is the gold standard uh, medication for Parkinson's disease. And there are a variety of formulations. There is, it says cinnamon IR, IR stands for immediate release. Uh, there's controlled release, Stilevo, Parcopa, Ritari and Duopa. Um, there are also all of these dopamine agonists that you can see on the screen as well. Um, how we decide what to use can vary. Uh, for example, Parcopa, the one you see uh, listed under Levodopa, that is, it dissolves in your mouth. So if you're having swallowing problems, we may choose that. Um, the Nupro is a patch. So it's a patch you can put on your skin uh, and that one stays on for 24 hours. So if a person has some problems with gastric um, absorption problems or can't remember to take medications as often or has a lot of problems with nausea and things, that might be an option. So there are a variety of different medications that we have the option to use. And I think if nothing else, you should be familiar at least with the names of them. You might not know exactly what they all do and that's on us to know that and to kind of know what's appropriate for you, but at least be familiar with the classifications of the drugs as well as um, you know, where they might fit in uh, as, as far as appropriateness for you. Um, there are also other medications that uh, we use that are in different classes. So uh, amantadine, artane, um, those medications can be more helpful that are more tremor specific again. Um, they're also used if a person is having some side effect that we call dyskinesia, which is kind of a wiggly movement um, due to treatment. Um, but they have their cons too. So if a person is having memory problems, we don't wanna use those medications. So again, uh, there's, a, there's definitely an art to treating Parkinson's disease. Uh, another class is selegiline. Uh, selegiline uh, can, it is a, what we call an MAOB inhibitor. And so it has a mood effect for people. 
Um, it can and improve mood, but it's also something that can have a lot of interactions with other medications. So other antidepressants, you just got to watch if a person's on those um, certain foods, we've got to watch um, for interaction. Um, and so it, it just may be appropriate for you, but it may not be based, based on those uh, considerations. Um, there's also a couple of uh, newer medications, Ongentis and Narayans are the newest medications, and those, uh, the goal is for people who are fluctuating or can tell when their medications kick in and wear off, uh, that it helps to stabilize that more and make the medications last longer. So those are the newest. There's also uh, what's called Duopa, which is an interjugenal pump. So that's uh, a surgery. Uh, and it goes into the abdomen and it's continuous levodopa through a pump. And then there's also a deep brain stimulator. And that's again, a surgical procedure uh, that is uh, especially effective in like tremor and some what we call dystonias. And uh, I do programming for that. I don't do the surgeries for it, of course, but work collaboratively with our colleagues in neurosurgery. And um, people can be programmed to get those symptoms under better uh, control with a deep brain stimulator. So some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are treatable as well. Um, most commonly, we tend to see like depression and anxiety. And so, that's kind of a question that's always, you know, what came first, the horse or the cart? If a person has uh, Parkinson's and their body's not listening, you know, to your brain telling it to move, well, that's going to generate some anxiety because you feel like there's a loss of control and you're feeling this change in your body. So of course that's gonna generate more anxiety. Um, but the disease itself changes neurotransmitters. Um, so obviously the, even the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease can weigh on people heavily and cause some depression as well. But again, it can be part of the organic process of Parkinson's. So some of it can be situational and some of it is organic in nature you know, how we deal with it. And right now I'm just covering kind of medications and medically, you know, how can you treat uh, the Parkinson's symptoms, both the motor and the non-motor. Later, I'm going to get into some of the non-medical, non-pharmaceutical ways that you can treat this as well, because there are certainly ways of trying to manage um, some of these symptoms without medications as well. And we definitely want to uh, put that power in your hand to be able to manage it. So uh, on the screen, you can see that um, there are antidepressant uh, agents that can help um, different classes of antidepressants. And these medications, again, have to fit the person. So we have to look at the patient's uh, history as far as what they've tried in the past. Um, also make sure that uh, you know, any kind of cardiac history, renal function, um, and especially with antidepressants, we tend to watch like sodium levels and things. So there are a number of extra steps with some of these medications that we need to take um, for continued monitoring. My, what I tend to tell my patients is uh, think about an actor who's portraying somebody who's depressed, okay, on, you know, in a movie. What do they do? Well, they stoop their posture, they drag their feet, you know, and they look Parkinsonian. So untreated depression can worsen symptoms, can worsen the look of Parkinson's disease. So it is important that if your other options that you've tried to manage your depression haven't worked and you do need a medication, it can actually improve your Parkinson's symptoms as well. Uh, the same goes for anxiety. Uh, anxiety drives tremor, right? So it doesn't cause it. That's not the cause of your tremor. But most people know that if they, you know, get upset about something, something's going on in the family, or there's some health issues or financial issues, 
or if the Packers are losing, you know, uh, there is an increase in anxiety and increase in adrenaline and it'll just fuel that tremor a little bit more. It can also uh, rev up any dyskinesia. So if a person is feeling like they have some kind of swaying movements, um, as well as that hesitancy that I talked about before, which is a freezing gait, it can worsen that symptom as well. So anxiety can definitely drive the tremor and the other symptoms to be worse as well. So sometimes getting it under control from an anxiety standpoint then translates into improved Parkinson's symptoms as well. Uh, sleep is another big issue. Most of my patients have trouble with sleep. Part of that can be due to what's called REM sleep disorder. And REM sleep is your rapid eye movement sleep. So that's what the REM stands for, rapid eye movement sleep. And, you know, most of my patients, if they're having problems during the night, it's either can't fall asleep or they wake up during the night and can't get back to sleep. If it's a problem for their spouse, it's usually that REM sleep disorder. So um, it doesn't really bother the patient a lot. They're dreaming a lot and acting out their dreams. Uh, but usually the spouse is saying, I'm not sleeping at night because you know, he's thrashing and um, or yelling out during the night or acting out dreams. Some of the patients notice it um, during the night. Mostly though, they wake up just kind of feeling tired, uh, like they haven't really slept well. And in some cases, I learned that my patients can do things and make movements during the night that they can't make during the day. So it can be very, uh, very active dreaming. Um, so sometimes it's a matter of treating that sleep at night so that you get a good consolidated sleep. You feel like you have that restorative sleep and you can take on the day the next day, right? So if all the natural options of trying to help improve your sleep hygiene don't work, there are medications that can help sleep. My major concern with that, of course, is I don't, I don't want people too sleepy during the day. And of course, I wanna be a minimalist with medication. So if we can do things or you can do things that actually can change and alter your sleep without a medication, we should always be going down that avenue first. There we go. Um, again, these are a couple of the anti-anxiety medications that are used. Um, and then we also have medications to try to improve memory. Um, memory is not an issue for everybody. Uh, but if it is an issue, then there are ways that we can treat it. Um, I always say there are four medications on the market, but technically there are five medications. And how we pick those just depends on the person again. Um, they don't make you 20, uh, they don't, you know, make it to where you have perfect short-term memory, but they can help to slow any progression of memory loss. And our real goal is if we can help even a little bit improve like verbal fluency. So getting your thoughts into words better then we certainly want to do whatever we can to try to enhance that so you can um, so you can have a better life and better communication with your family. So this piece of the of the talk is a bit of the meat and potatoes, as you can see, um, more of the pearls for everyday living. And I put this in here because, yeah, we have medications and things, but I, I think most of you are probably coming on going, how do I manage this? How do I manage Parkinson's disease on my own? And um, what can I do and what kind of changes can I make? Or at least I hope you're thinking that because um, this is collaborative. You can't just give all that power to a pill and you can't give all that power to your provider. There are definitely things that you can do in a positive or a negative way that affect your Parkinson's disease. There we go, oops, there we go. 
So I just wanted to touch base as far as when we are talking about medications, um, it's really important to make sure you have a method for managing medications. When I was talking about like uh, any of the anti-Parkinson's medications, most of them start at three times per day. And if you haven't really taken a lot of medications before, starting to take medications three times a day can be really difficult. So um, there, are, there are a lot of dosing times um, in treatment with Parkinson's disease. So you might have to organize in a new way. Um, so setting up pill boxes so that you remember, um, you can set cell phone uh, timers so that you are reminded to take your dose on time. Um, you might need, if your uh, significant other or a loved one has memory problems, you might want to uh, work on timed pill boxes or locked pill boxes so that it's regulated when those medications are available to people so there's no medication errors. Um, there is also bubble packing that's an uh, option at the pharmacy. Uh, they do usually charge a fee for it and it'll be delivered. And those bubble packs are set up for you so that even if you have pills, you have to split, the pharmacist does that for you. So if you have difficulty with tremor and can't split your pills or managing all of those dosing times and how you set them up is more difficult, you can get them bubble packed. Um, just ask your pharmacy about it. Um, if pill taking is difficult because of swallowing problems, um, and that can be part of Parkinson's, um, A, know that that is something that can be responsive to levodopa, so that can be responsive to treatment. So it should be part of your plan on, on improvement when you're assessing your medications. But also you wanna make sure that the pills go down okay so you can get them in. So you might need to mix them with either some Greek yogurt or applesauce. Make sure you wet your whistle before you take them. Um, ask your provider about other options. I mentioned before about Parcopa. That's a medication that dissolves without water. Um, that can be an option for surgeries or hospitalizations. So sometimes when I'm working inpatient, I have a, somebody who's even maybe more confused or they're, they're not supposed to really take a lot of uh, food by mouth at that time. And so that dissolves on the tongue and that can be an option as well. Um, Ritari is a long, longer acting carbidopa levodopa. It actually has a third immediate release and two thirds extended release. Um, and that's excellent. If people have problems with swallowing, they can open that capsule and they can sprinkle it in applesauce and take it. Uh, so it's, it's made for people who are having swallowing problems as well. And then there's that new pro patch, the transdermal patch. So that avoids the gut completely um, and swallowing completely. So that's an option. Um, the immediate release, carbidopa, levodopa can be, that's the yellow pill that, that can be crushed, but um, the extended release can't be crushed. That has to be uh, broken, um, but, or taken whole. Um, and I mean, broken in half. Um, and then there are rescue medications that can be used um, if there's fluctuations and times when you notice that there's some off times and really need to get out of those jams. Um, you can use Apokin, which is an injection, Embresia, which is an inhaler, and um, Kenobi, which is a, um, is a sublingual film. So it's just a film you put on your tongue um, that are quick acting forms of uh, medication to help you move better quick. Um, a little bit more on swallowing. Um, again, like I said, the treatment goal should be uh, that that's something that you're monitoring with levodopa treatment. Um, one of the tips I tend to give people for that also is making sure that you're uh, not eating larger meals when you feel like your medications aren't working as well, because when you're low on dopamine, your swallowing can be more impaired. So you always want to be eating meals when your meds are working or when you feel like your symptoms are improved or optimized because otherwise you're more at risk for aspiration. Um, avoid things like popcorn or 
uh, crumbly food. Um, some people find even just more breads um, um, tend to be more bothersome. Uh, rice tends to be troublesome for some people. Um, and make sure you take your time, make it a quiet space. Don't make it something that where you're feeling like people are watching you, right? Uh, you're feeling pressured to eat in a, in a fast timeline or in an area where there's just kind of too much distraction because you want to focus and concentrate on swallowing. Make sure you report this stuff to your provider. It's likely that they're going to order a swallow study. Sometimes that's done by a speech therapist at the bedside to watch you eat and give you tips and try to figure out what's going on. Other times it needs a video fluoroscopy to see if there's any stricture in the throat um, or if this is related to the actual swallowing reflux being diminished. Uh, one of the tips I give to all of my patients that have any type of swallowing problem is to use um, a spirometer. Now, a spirometer is that, little, that plastic thing you get if you go to the hospital. And especially if you have any breathing issues or if you've been laying in bed, they give you this clear plastic contraption that has a little red ball in it. And you're supposed to blow in it and get that ball up as high as you can make it go. And you're, what you're trying to do is get all that gunk out of your chest if you've been laying in bed too long. Okay. So um, with my patients who have any type of dysphagia or swallowing problem, I tell them to use that after meals because that'll help clear their lungs and get all that gunk out of there. And some people also use them first thing in the morning because they feel like they've had more nasal drip um, and because of more saliva or more nasal drip and they feel like they're frothy in the morning. So I have them use that to try to initiate um, expelling that out of your lungs. Water is really important and I can't stress it enough. The main symptoms of not enough water is constipation, dizziness, and confusion. Now those are also uh, potential problems with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's can cause a decrease in your gut motility or your bowel motility. So just like maybe your feet don't move as fast as they're supposed to, your stomach isn't too. Uh, you have what's called peristalsis, which is a contraction of that bowel. And it's supposed to help push your food through and expel it out. Well, in Parkinson's, it's, it's supposed to be a hard contraction, you know. In Parkinson's, it's less. There's not as much contraction of that bowel. So there tends to be constipation due to lack of bowel motility, but that's going to be even worse if you're not hydrated. So you know what it feels like to have a dry mouth and try to choke down a peanut butter sandwich, right? So you imagine now the other way where your bowel lining is dry um, because the first place your body steals water from is your bowel. So you're going to be more constipated. Now, not only do you have problems with motility, now you also have a dry bowel. So if you're experiencing constipation, please first start with water. Um, I know what goes in must come out, So, um, but that there's a fine balance there. Same with dizziness. Uh, the number one issue we see in neurology is, uh, is dizziness. In general, neurology coming through the door is dizziness. Um, and your body, your brain is 80% water. So it doesn't like to be low on water. So um, it'll let you know it. And it's usually some changes in cognition or dizziness, especially if you have the problem, like we see often with Parkinson's with low blood pressure or problems where you're having a dizziness when you go from sitting to standing. The best natural treatment for that is water. If you can increase your overall fluid balance and increase that hydration, you can stabilize that naturally without getting extra pills. In people who are having memory problems, the first sign of, uh, in, uh, of dehydration is increase in confusion. So if uh, you notice a sudden change in somebody's mentation, we look for uh, dehydration, uh, urinary tract infection, which often comes from dehydration or any kind of infection. So it can cause cognitive slowing, fogginess, 
So if you're not even, it, it might not be confusion or dizziness. It just might be fogginess, you know, or lack of concentration. And in some cases, especially if people are having memory problems, it can be more overt and cause confusion or even visual hallucinations. So drink more water if you've got dry skin, constipation, visual um, um, blurriness, uh, mental fog, fatigue, uh, dark urine, of course, um, and any kind of dizziness or muscle cramps. Um, like I said, everything that goes in must come out, right? Um, the best thing to do, obviously, when you are drinking water and trying to stay hydrated is not to chug it, right? You don't, you're not going to put, you know, I've got this big giant bottle. We're not going to drink all of this at one time. Um, you really want to be kind of sipping on it throughout the day or ration it out throughout the day. And then you might want to use a bladder training program. That's what we call it. It's, it's kind of getting to the bathroom every two hours to, to urinate, whether you've got to go or not. And what that does is eliminate the problem that when your bladder decides, I got to go now, right? It's overstretched. Those receptors are screaming at you. And now you got to get to the bathroom quick. And your brain says go and your feet say no, right? So um, that can be a real problem. You want to avoid that urgency to get there and just make sure that you're draining your bladder regularly so that it's not waiting for those pain receptors to tell you that it's overdue. Um, you also may want to cut down on caffeine um, because that's going to stimulate the bladder and make you go more often. What you can do is if you're having problems and you feel like, boy, I just went 30 minutes ago and now I got to go again, um, try some bladder massage when you're sitting on the toilet um, you can actually massage that abdomen some to help to try to release some of those pockets of urine that we see with bladder spasms. So a little gentle massage on the bladder can actually help you um, expel more of the urine. Um, in some cases, we prescribe what's called pelvic floor exercises. And that can be very uh, beneficial. And that's done by a therapist, a trained pelvic floor exercise therapist. And that helps you to actually work up those muscles better. And it's especially good uh, uh, women who've had many babies uh, that those muscles tend to weaken over time. And it's more than just doing kegels. Um, it's very specialized. So that's always an option as well. Bowels in, par in Parkinson's, like I said, constipation's an issue. So water is super important. So is fiber, but Fiber is only good if you chase it with enough water, otherwise you're gonna get more constipated again. So um, probiotics are important because those are the, the, they promote good gut health and help to break all of that down and uh, keep, uh, keep your flora of your gut intact. Um, some of my patients, I kind of put it on my slide here. Some of my patients swear by that murky apple cider, you know, don't get the clear stuff at the store, but get the murky apple cider. Um, and they swear that uh, that or apple a day just really helps them a lot too. But there are medications that can obviously help with um, constipation uh, and also with gut motility itself. As far as the anxiety, uh, depression, and sleep disturbance goes, like I said, there are ways of combating that without just uh, relying on medications. And most of us aren't really ready for what throw, you know, Parkinson's throws at us. It's all new. It's a learning curve. So um, it takes a while to be able to uh, get a hold of that and take, uh, take command, I guess, so to speak. I feel like one of the best things you can do is first just identify that you're either stewing on a problem. So if you tend to ruminate a lot, and maybe that's your problem, why you can't get to sleep at night, your brain just won't shut off, right? Um, you've got something on your mind and you know you're not gonna fix it before bed, but you just can't get your brain to turn off. Well, meditation's a good way to start. And you might think, ah, that's goofy. I don't really wanna learn meditation, but it's actually quite useful and empowering. And it takes a while to learn. But the key really is about um, trying to find ways of helping yourself feel calmer and less stressed. Um, and also if you need to, to improve your sleep quality as well. 
Um, and you can start practicing this just 10 minutes a day. There are classes you can take on meditation. There are apps, there are videos, there are many different resources, um, but it's a good way of trying to take control of both mood, you know, anxiety, depression, as well as trying to curb any um, problems that you might be having with falling asleep as well. Um, um, you can also, I say to people, you can create what's called a vision board. You know, we're all going to have good days and bad days. And sometimes what we tend to do is have a lot of these negative thoughts. Uh, uh, I have a lot of patients that come in and they say, boy, just coming here and having you tell me that I'm okay. Um, you know, I wish I could do this every month, you know, and, um, and they kind of just need those encouraging words that things haven't changed. You're going to have good and bad days. Um, your family's going to look at you strange sometimes when one day you can do something and the next day you just can't. That's the way Parkinson's rolls. So um, you may find yourself talking negatively. Oh, I'm going downhill. I'm, I feel like I'm falling apart. What next? What's my outlook? And those are normal things to think, but too often, too much can have a very negative impact on your health. Where your mind goes, your body goes. I know that to be true. Uh, so it's very important to make sure you're doing everything healthy to try to keep your thoughts in check. And a vision board can be a good way of doing that. It can just have some kind of positive affirmations or things that uh, you need. And this is very personal. A vision board's very personal. So um, it might be just a picture of a sunshine and just kind of thinking about, I'm going to start my day being in the light and finding the positive in my day today so you don't automatically go towards the negative things that you can't do. Find one thing that you can do. Um, there is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's, it's general. That's not just for Parkinson's disease, but like I said, we're not all equipped with the tools to be able to handle everything that's thrown at us, no matter what in life. And we don't always want just medications for that, but cognitive behavioral therapy is stopping your thoughts and going, why am I thinking this way? I'm, if I do this or this happens, I'm not going to die. I'm, you know, this thought process that I've got going on is really negative. And then finding ways with a therapist to be able to bring that back home to something maybe more realistic or rational, and then finding way alternative ways of kind of coping and dealing with it. So cognitive behavioral therapy can be very helpful. The other things are definitely either uh, joining a support group and definitely joining an exercise group or at least having an exercise regimen. Um, exercise is a fantastic outlet. For me, it's actually also kind of a mandatory piece of our care plan. Uh, the people who exercise regularly do better and they are on less medication. The prognosis for their course is different than people who are not exercising. Part of that is a mental state because you know you can feel you're doing something to improve your health and there's a certain amount of control you gain back by doing that. Um, and the other piece of it is you're getting better, you're getting stronger. Parkinson's doesn't own you. So uh, it really is important to make sure that you've got a plan. And especially in the winter here in Wisconsin, you better have a winter plan. I get on my soapbox every fall and talk about a winter plan with people. What do you have at home for equipment? What's your, how motivated are you do it, to do it on your own? Or do you need a group setting to hold you accountable and that socialization? Support groups are a great way to uh, gain more information, uh, talk to other people who are in the same shoes. Uh, they're great for caregivers as well. And I feel like it's really a big piece of um, managing and coping with Parkinson's disease. So at Neuroscience Group, we have um, a memory care program. Actually, tomorrow, Thursdays, are my memory clinic days. There's 
two of us there that are we're certified through the Alzheimer's Association as a memory care program. I put this on here just because I want you to kind of know that there are, you know, there are specialties in memory and it's not always Parkinson's disease. So you can have Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. You can have Parkinson's and a vascular memory um, problem. We call it vascular dementia. There's Lewy body dementia. There's frontal temporal dementias. There's a lot of different types of memory issues. So if you feel like you or a loved one has a problem with memory, it should be worked up. It should be better assessed. What we tend to do or what I tend to do in my memory clinic is I'm looking at the health history to see what your risk factors are, of course. So like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, diabetes, all of those things that can put you at more risk for memory problems. And then we tend to get, make sure we have an MRI to look at if there's any atrophy or shrinkage. We look to see if there's microvascular changes in the brain. Um, we're ruling out a condition called normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, and then we also get in-depth neurocognitive testing and also looking at labs for any metabolic disorders that could be causing problems. And checking all your memory or all your medication lists to make sure that there's not a medication that you're on that could be worsening your memory. So if you feel that there is um, a memory problem, it's nothing to kind of brush under the carpet. You really want to get it investigated because it can make uh, treatment of Parkinson's much more difficult as well. So I would just encourage you that if there is uh, some um, issue with memory that you further investigate that as well. So I'm going to open it up because I know we're kind of getting close to time to being done, but I want to take your questions if, uh, if any of you have them. Thank you. So, oh, we do have a question from Helen. Uh, in addition, can you read that? Yeah. So it says, in addition to mirtazapine, what treatments are there to improve sleep and minimize acting out? Um, so again, sometimes that sometimes we do sleep studies to kind of know a little bit more if people are having, um, you know, what kind of a problem it is with uh, the REM sleep and, and sleep disorders and things. Um, it depends on the person again. So there are, there are many different medications and uh, a lot of it depends on your medication profile to see if you've tried a certain class of medications and failed them, um, or if there are any cognitive issues, because um, it is really difficult with the REM sleep disorder with acting out a lot during the night um, on kind of treating that. It's kind of harder to get that under control. Sometimes you can use something that's called clonazepam, but that's a controlled substance, you know, so we don't always want to use that. It can help with sleep but we wouldn't wanna use it if you had a memory problem. Sometimes it's a matter of adjusting your carbidopa levodopa time. So especially if you're on a longer acting levodopa, like a extended release right at bedtime, sometimes just pushing that back a little further so it's not so close to bedtime will decrease that REM sleep disorder. So it's not always adding more medications. For me, sometimes it's adjusting what I'm using for Parkinson's medication. And I say that because we do know from previous studies that that REM sleep disorder is due to the underlying issue, but it can be increased by some of the long acting medication closer to bedtime. So that can be a, one way of, of looking at that as well. And sometimes pushing that levodopa back just doesn't do anything for it. So um, I hope that answers some of your question. Um, and then somebody else had a question saying, how long does DBS plan work? Do you mean like the, so the deep brain, how long does a stimulator work um, is what I'm assuming that that means. And they, they continue to work. We, we program and make adjustments to the settings. Um, now they may or may not have a battery pack that needs recharged by at home on a regular basis, or it's something that needs replaced. So, um, but as far as like how long the stimulator works, um, it really doesn't kind of go kaput unless the battery dies. Um, it, it's really just a matter of um, making adjustments to that stimulator. And a lot of times 
people are still on medications too. So the stimulator doesn't always replace medications. So it makes it somewhat more difficult in a way of just kind of going, well, what do we change the stimulator or the medications? But that's really something that I know more so usually in the visit to know which one we need to make adjustments to um, with your regimen. Um, and then somebody put um, questioning about the use of Delta-8 gummy for anxiety. Um, again, we can't prescribe that. That's not something that um, we can you know, necessarily suggest or prescribe. I've had patients that have used it and um, some feel that it helps and some feel that it doesn't. And I think part of that is based on um, you know, that Cinderella shoe to see if it fits. And then other times it may be quality uh, of the type of what they're using. Um, and I don't always know that. So I don't, I really don't know the source. So I can't really give a ton of input on it, but I've had, I've had mixed reviews from my patients. And I think that's one of those things that when you're like in a support group, it's good for you guys to kind of compare notes and go, you know, did it, did it work for you? Did it, did it not? Um, did I have any side effects with it? Um, anything else that anybody had a question on? Yeah, Daisy, there was one in the Q&A section. Oh. The question is, does DBS for tremors work for how long? Number of yeah. years? Yeah, and again, I mean, I've, I mean, I have people who have had DBS and uh, for their tremor and it's just always worked. Now, other times, you know, we need to make adjustments to the stimulator. So it's, that's kind of a hard thing to say. It's not like the effects wear off, you know? Um, so like the stimulator, if it's been effective for you after surgery, it usually continues to be effective. I've got a number of people that, um, that boy, you turn off their stimulator and it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's made a huge difference and impact on their tremor. I think that most people just have to decide when, what's, what's the time for that? Have you exhausted the medications? Um, and feel like, hey, nothing, if nothing's worked for medications, then, you know, that's something that is definitely a consideration and can be helpful. And it's really a matter of the clinician and, um, and being able to do that initial programming to find how well they can get that tremor under good control. But I've had good experience with it. And then we just had a, a, a nice comment from Helen saying, thank you, great presentation. I would recommend it. <laughs> Good. Good. Any other questions that you have? No, I don't see that's the same one from before. I don't think so. If we don't have any other questions, I want to thank you, Daisy, so much. I appreciate your time and your great information. And thank you to everybody who participated. I'm sorry, I should turn my video on. <laughs> there we go. We <laughs> yes. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. If you've come up with any other questions afterwards, don't hesitate to um, email myself or Raven. Otherwise, everybody have a great night and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. Stay healthy.